Welcome to theCUBE's special live coverage of Vast Cosmos. We're going from New York City to Palo Alto to Boston. The Cube is pleased to be broadcasting the latest innovations in AI, data, and ecosystems that are forming to create the future of intelligent innovation. My name is Dave Vellante, and I'll be your host of this Analyst Angle. And joining me are Rob Strecce from theCUBE Research and Jack Gold, founder of J Gold Associates. Gents, welcome. Welcome Thank to theCUBE. Good to have you. Okay, so we heard today from Marianne Budnick kicked off the program. She was she is the CMO of Vast, Renan Halak, the CEO. Jeff Denworth came on. He's a co-founder. He got super technical, geeked out big time, uh, which is awesome. We heard about the Vast data platform, which you know has been the their historical product. It's a full stack infrastructure layer. The Vast data store, uh, which again is the history of the company. But then last year we heard about the the vast uh, d data base, which was introduced a year ago as part of Build Beyond, which is this parallel transaction database that does analytics. And it's got this, we heard about this novel lock management that's got full system observability, bridging the gap between structured and unstructured data, disaggregated, shared everything. I mean, it's just really kind of back to, you know, deep computer science roots for those of you who are interested in that kind of stuff. Um, run, you know, running anywhere. Vast calls this the OS, for uh, the AI uh, age, which is kind of interesting, Rob. What's your take on what you heard today? We're going to get into the news, but what's your overall take on the announcement? Yeah, I think the two big things that they talked about was really the, the Cosmos community that they're building out and really aiming at you know, AI and bringing it together. And I think also was the, you know, really the engine for insights that they're building out that really is about how do you kind of, uh, I guess you could say, move up the stack and continue to move up mm -hmm. the stack from a data perspective and be more of that data layer for people doing AI. And I, I thought it was a really interesting set of announcements, uh, not to mention that they are going further with some of the database uh, type stuff for streaming data and things like that with Kafka under the hood. And of course we heard it from a ton of customers and partners, we'll get into that a little bit. You know, Jack, there was this hilarious, um, I don't know if you remember, uh, Saturday Night Live skit back in the day it was Dan Aykroyd and Gilda Radner, and they were sort of debating whether this new product was a floor wax or a dessert topping. And then, <laughs> and then Chevy Chase came in and he said, it's both. And that's, you know, it reminds me, the reason I bring that up is vast. It's like, okay, they were a storage company and now they're a data company, they're a database company, they're an AI company, they're an AI infrastructure, an operating system for AI. You know, it could have all of the above. What's your take? Yeah, so forgive my pun, but they're trying to move up the stack. Right, they're 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 trying to get more in in the face of end users. They, before they were mostly an infrastructure play, no one really noticed that. Not I shouldn't say they didn't notice them, but they were under the you know under the covers more more or less. They're trying to move up to a level that says, hey, without us, you you can't do AI from an enterprise perspective, and and that's actually probably a pretty good play for them because if they can move up the stack, when, when they can charge more. Uh, and number two, the visibility also helps them as they try to go to an IPO in the not too distant future. That, that's certainly not a bad thing. So uh, I, I like the the idea of of trying to again move up the stack, being being more embedded uh, but visible to people as opposed to just being under the covers. So Vast is one of these companies that's like really focused on solving hard problems, and it's, yeah. it's and, and coming at it with novel approaches. So let's try to unpack some of that. One of the things we heard today was LLMs are becoming more intelligent, but they're not real time. They're a big focus on real time, and I want to come back to that. And, and they need access to proprietary data and specialized data. This gets into the long tail, the, the, the power law of the Cube Gen AI that you guys, the Cube Research, and we put out. Um, but specialized models, maybe small language models, or we're going to get into agents, small action models, or even large action models. So what do you make about you know, that commentary there, Rob? Yeah, I, I think exactly what Jack was saying, as they move up the stack, they're looking to be the platform where you run the majority of that intelligence and you do your embeddings. And so I think what they've been doing is subsuming different pieces that you've seen in DBMSs and things of that nature. Like the embeddings is definitely a shot at vector and at knowledge graph. And what they're trying to do is be able to connect all of the data underneath there so that you can query it a lot faster from through that NIMS layer uh, that they are now also embedding inside the vast uh, data you know, construct using containers. So 
you know, I guess not embedded, but they're sitting in containers on top of the vast hardware and operating system doing the NIMS NVIDIA stuff. So you, I think, you know, again, you have to want to use that stack under the hood for doing the embeddings and things of that nature. But what that's also doing is it's not only subsuming some of the DBMS, it's also moving up the layer into that compute engine layer. Uh, that, you know, people like a Databricks or a Snowflake or others have talked about as being kind of where they want to compete. And so I, I think there's an interesting, uh, I guess you could say, dichotomy and, you know, of what is the division of labor and what is that, where is, who, where are you going to have, where are you going to build your action models, where are you going to yeah. build your agents? Well, if that's up at the compute layer and all that it's doing is calling down into the vast, you know, abstracted insight engine, which is NVIDIA under the hood, again, you're talking, you know, that translation there. I, I think it's a really smart move on their part for being more important, as Jack was saying, up the stack and being more visible in the AI layer. It's interesting you mentioned Snowflake because it's, it's somewhat Snowflake-like in that the value proposition um, rests upon putting the data inside of the system so that it can be governed and controlled. And, and that is the promise that if you bring it in here, we're going to be fast, you know, we're going to be more cost effective, we're going to be governed, we're going to have all the lineage, et cetera, et cetera. And so it is kind of competitive in that regard, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and I think that where they're going and where they're looking from the, you know, query prompt down is to be that server of the data unstructured, structured, what have you across that, and to be the ones that index that, that do the embeddings, that really, I guess you could say, prepare the data to be utilized for AI. And I think it's very AI specific in where they're, you know, this infrastructure is built. It's not built out to be, you know, multi-purpose in that way. It's really built to leverage that. It doesn't mean that you don't go and put, because they were talking about streaming data and things like that. You could think of building an agent on your website for retail that actually needs streaming data and first party uh, data that is streaming in. Well, okay, you come in through that at the top of cop, cop, top, uh, Kafka topics, say that 10 times fast, are assigned automatically, embedded, and then you're using that data in, you know, in coordination with some RAG. I, I could see that it makes a lot of sense what they're doing in that layer as well. So let's bring Jack you into this conversation. My first question to you is Vector, is if they're, they're building Vector into their database, the vast database, where do you land on Vector? Is it a feature or is it, or is it should it be a sort of a separate thing? I mean, there's enough, is there enough value to have a sort of separate Vector database? Obviously the Vector database guys would say that, but what, what do you think about it? Yeah, of course. Look, I, I think where Vast is trying to to go is to be the, the data consolidator. And I don't mean that in the traditional sense where we're talking about, you know, a, a data lake house or whatever. They want to be the central point for me being able to get to my data no matter where it is, anywhere in the world, in any format, vector, you know, SQL, whatever it's going to be. Structured, I don't, I don't unstructured. Structured, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I don't care. Video, audio, text. And if they can pull that off uh, effectively, that puts them really at the central control point for all the data I'm going to be using in my AI world. And I think that's really where they're trying to get to. Now, can they do it? It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, they're, they're well on their way to do it, I think. But, but uh, you know, they're, they're trying to be the consolidator that allows me to get to any data in real time, no matter where it's located around the world. Sounds like a really big problem. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's if, there, if nothing else, fast is ambitious. Right. Um, <laughs> let's talk about RAG because people are excited about RAG. Um, you hear everybody's talking about it. Dell talks about it. Oracle talked about it. The cloud world, we heard that, and everybody's excited about it. But when we look at the data, Rob and and Jack from our partner, survey partner ETR, not a ton of people are doing RAG. Right. You know, and those that are, it's limited. I mean, it's not of great value. It's complex. Um, and, and so I'd be interested in your thoughts on, uh, let's start with Jack, how VAST is solving this problem and will it, how will it make a difference to customers? Yeah, the problem with RAG for most people uh, is just accessing the data to, to help fine tune, not fine tune, but RAG the model, if you will. Yeah. Um, it's hard to get the data in, it's hard to get it in in real time, which is really what you need to do if you're gonna, if you're gonna use AI in any production environment. Uh, it's costly. 
Uh, you may not even know where the data is. So what VAST is trying to do uh, is, I think is great, which is, I don't care where your data is, just point us to the data, we'll kind of be the consolidator, we'll bring it in, we'll, we'll put it into one format, we'll be able to do it in real time. Uh, we're, we're, we're breaking down the silos of data into more of a, you know, of a plane, if you will, uh, a mesh. Um, that's very valuable for RAG because that's what gets you to the real-time environment. If you can't do this in real time, then it, it, RAG doesn't work for most, most people. Well, let's talk about real time. And there was a huge focus um, the announcement on real time and the difficult challenges of AI retrieval in, 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 in the, they've announced an in-architecture vector database. Right. Um, they've got this globally, they talked about globally consistent atomic file system, which eliminates the whole batch operations and it's, and it's scalable. So real time, we talk about real time digital representation of your business all the time. Rob, what are your thoughts on, on how real this is, how important it is, and you know, can they pull it off? Yeah, I mean, I think that them being able to use streaming in Kafka to inject into uh, tables on the fly and be able to index it, embed it, and do all of these uh, really, I, I guess you could say the heavy lifting of the DBMS for both real-time and kind of bulk transactions that really helps them. I think that where people were looking was, hey, how do I get the two sets of data to be coexisting so that when they're coexisting, I, I'm to your point, Jack's point here, is that really I'm not pulling all of my data from a rag which could have uh, a life a shelf life right. on it. And I think that's the big piece of what you know Jeff was getting at as well in his part was there's a shelf life to normal rag and you have to be able to version that stuff as well. But at the same time, you need to bring in other data from other systems to be able to coordinate that so that you actually answer the question because you may or may not have all of the data, you know, domiciled inside the vast engine, I guess you could say. So let's talk about the news. Uh, we saw Renan Halak, uh, CEO and, and co-founder, sat down with Jensen at Jensen's offices. Um, and talked about the big announcement here, the vast um, insight engine with NVIDIA, which unlocks insights from all enterprise data, uh, the world's first solution to securely ingest, process, and retrieve all, to Jack's point, enterprise data files, objects, tables, and streams in real time. Um, talked about the first application workflow to run on the vast data platform. Um, so, you know, this is, we were, we were told that this could be available, or will be available in the first half of 2025. So pretty aggressive schedule here. It's things like this that I think, you know, potentially can help us get better ROI out of, out of AI, which a lot of people are concerned about, uh, the whole process and retrieval engine for enterprise data hosted natively inside the VASC platform. So let me start with you, Jack, what's your take on the announcement? Yeah, I think it's a, it's certainly a big deal. Um, it, it's very NVIDIA centric because they're working with the NIMS platform, the right. NVIDIA stuff uh, as a microservice. Uh, but if they can pull this off, what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, look, um, if you've got data out there that you're updating, you know, once a week, once a month, once a year, <laughs> in a batch process, we're going to be able to pull that in in real time. And, and you're not going to be just updating it once a year, or not have to load it up to a cloud somewhere into a central data lake, a data warehouse somewhere. We're going to be able to build a mesh that allows us to pull all that data in real time, put it into the NIMS system, which uh, is a way of actually trying to do real time updates of, of AI. Uh, and we're going to give you a, a, a RAG system. If you want to go RAG, there are other ways to do this as well that will allow you to get the data you need to get the work done that you want to be done. And, and in, uh, uh, we haven't talked about cost yet, that's a whole different issue, but in a reasonable time frame, yeah. sure. So I think it is certainly a big deal for them if they can do this. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming they can, or they probably wouldn't have announced it, or Benson certainly wouldn't have been on stage with them if he didn't think they could do it. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a, a game changer for these guys. And so the database, they also announced the vast database supports vectors and right. graphs, so vector embeddings and then, and then graph database. Also, there's a Kafka broker inside the fast, uh, vast database, so they're eliminating all the copying and the ETLing and all the movement into a data lake. Um, they really stressed, Rob, governance um, and, and the compliance. So it's sort of this all-in-one, it's all there, as Jack's been saying, any data, anywhere, 
you know, encompassed in this platform. Yeah, and, and this goes back to them moving up stack that we've both talked about, Jack and I, around how they're moving more into that layer, even using AI and, like you said, the, the Nemos and NIMS retriever technology to create those embeddings that is solves for that, that uh, vector database and the knowledge graph, uh, but also the Kafka for the streaming and how that integrates it. They're, they're really, it, it reminds me of everybody who's talking about uh, private AI. And when you start to look at private AI and what, you know, the easy button to get to AI, this could be a big accelerator because what you're then talking about is, hey, I'm bringing in some, you know, other NVIDIA uh, kit on top of this that's running, you know, my PyTorch and other stuff and my, my kind of AI agent layer, you could say. And then those agents are making those calls in, you know, say, you know, today, SQL, maybe in the future, they were talking about Python, down into that data layer to then bring out what they need out of the data layer instead of having to go to a data lake that's on other hardware or into a cloud. And so it could simplify significantly the stack for those those consumers of this, like the HSBCs who were on, you know, showing off what they were doing, uh, or Grok and XAI folks and things like that, where maybe you don't need, you can do more, you know, as we would talk about, uh, you know, agentic type stuff up above that, and that becomes more complex, where you're looking and you need more compute to actually make those queries down to that data layer. Well, if you have, if your data layer gets smarter and has some of that AI technology in it, like the NIMS and Neo and the retrievers and stuff like that, you're already ahead of the game for pulling that data. And you know, to Jack's point, it becomes more real time, it becomes more a, a faster retrieval of that that helps you achieve and you can do new things, solve for new problems, which to your point on ROI is I think one of the big problems is that the data changes so fast, how do you keep up with it so you're not giving the wrong answers? And, and I want to come back to Agentic, but I, but before we do, we heard a lot about atomicity, at, at, at the, at the atomic you know, capabilities. You know, you remember in the spinning disk drive days, you know, that was the big <laughs> bottleneck, right? And you'd have to go through these chatty SCSI protocols to, to actually get a write done. And if something went wrong, then the, the system would take a long time to recover. And, and then, you know, with flash storage, you've got atomic rights and NVMe, and, and that was a big change. And it was interesting to hear Jeff talk about that because in computer science, uh, you know, atomicity is something that ensures that transaction is treated as a single uh, unit, indivisible yeah. unit, so that, that, that if it goes, something goes wrong, you've got recovery mechanisms in there. David Floyer taught me this, you know, decades ago that he was always asked, what happens if something goes wrong? And a lot of times the answer would be, well, you know, we kind of have this eventual consistency thing. And, and so um, VAST is taking care of all that. And that, that was something that, that Jeff spent a fair amount of time. He really didn't get into what it all means. But I think there's, there's underlying technology here um, that ultimately is going to build trust with customers. What your take, Jeff? Well, and that's their secret sauce, mm -hmm. right? That's where they came from. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it was all about that uh, when, when they first started out with the new algorithms and with the NVMEs, uh, that's exactly what they were trying to, to get around, the, the problem they were trying to get around. Uh, and now they're extending beyond that. So um, I, I think that it actually makes an awful lot of sense from an ROI perspective because, look, if one data bit goes bad, if one vector goes bad versus thousand vectors because you're trying to write a thousand vectors all at once, that's a, that's a much easier problem to solve than it is if you're you know, trying to do all thousand of them and correct those. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things was they had Core Weave on as well. Yeah. And Core Weave talked about the checkpointing and the fact that they can write down all the checkpoints all at once yeah. to that exact point. And I think that's where it comes in for AI because if you have to redo a training run because your checkpoints get all screwed up uh, or you lose checkpoints, that's a bad, that's big time badness. The other big announcement is the vast Cosmos, you know, tech community with the mission to simplify and accelerate AI adoption, exploration and discovery. Um, it, it, they're build, bringing together all these organizations who care about AI and have you know, expertise to build and advance AI by creating a comprehensive and supportive environment to nurture innovation. Um, the community is, is built of AI practitioners, 
and for AI practitioners. Um, so it's of and for researchers, technology partners, service providers, solution integrators. So we heard from a number of folks. Uh, you mentioned CoreWeave. Uh, we heard from CTO of Deloitte, Ch Chen Zuckerberg uh, was on the list, G2 Patel uh, from Cisco, Manavir Das, as well as Jensen from NVIDIA. My man John Lin from Equinix was on there, Andrew Ang. Uh, you had investors from like NEA, Supermicro, and, and many, many more. Uh, what do you guys make of this community push? It's interesting that VAST is putting itself at the center of that community, and it was able to coordinate so many big players, big thinkers, big brains to come together. What were your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a very interesting uh, play. I, I think that maybe, uh, you know, part of it was the fact that uh, the AI Alliance, which does not include NVIDIA, uh, has Intel and AMD and IBM and a number of other research organizations as well as commercial. Uh, I, I think maybe this is a play to uh, really offset that non-NVIDIA uh, based. And uh, NVIDIA is doing a lot in, we see them, they'll, pro they'll be at uh, the CNCF, at KubeCon and CloudNativeCon, uh, talking about how they're bringing stuff to Kubernetes and stuff. Uh, but I think, again, it's, it's a, a place for them to play as well. And I think you see some of the others who are in that community like Dremio and others uh, really are helping out bring it to be more of a data community, uh, which I find very interesting. It'll be interesting because, you know, Meta's in the other one and where do the model providers come in when you, when you talk about this community? So I think it's, it's going to be interesting to watch. I thought they played it very cleverly though. I think there was a lot of FOMO in there. Oh, they got Jensen. You know, okay, he's in. Um, I better jump in here because I don't want to be left out. What are your thoughts on that? Well, well Jensen's and everything, of course. I mean, right. it's, it's, you know, if, if, if he's not on stage, then you're not making an AI announcement these days. I mean, that's just the way it is. Look, generically, I think it's a, a really good move to have as many outside sources as you can coming in and, and increasing the knowledge, the AI knowledge, if you will. I mean, when we build a big AI model, what do we do? We try to bring in as many data sources as we possibly can to train that model so that we get the best answers possible. This is, on, on a human level, kind of the same thing. Um, there are other uh, open AI type initiatives that, that Rob talked about, and there, there'll probably be even more. Um, this is really, I think, about VAST and NVIDIA getting together and saying, we know this is gonna happen. We know they're gonna be open initiatives. We know they're gonna be groups out there. Let's see if we can focus that effort in kind of our space, as opposed to, just having a generic open source kind of a community. And so if it works for them, if they can do that, it's to their advantage because people will be concentrating. Just like NVIDIA concentrated on CUDA, they're trying to say, they're not saying it obviously, but they're trying to push it towards if we can get everyone working on the vast platform with NVIDIA in the background, then, then we win long-term. Yeah, and, and I want to come back to something that Jensen said at GTC in the spring. He talked about, you know, Jensen like sees, her, sees around corners because he's ahead of everybody on this. He talked about reasoning. He said, AI in the future, you're going to give it a, a, a query and it's going to go off. You, it's going to allow, you're going to allow it to go off and think maybe for a week or two. And you're going to say, I got $2,000 to spend on this. Go reason. Now we've seen glimpses of, of that with ChatGPT 1.0 where it'll take 30 or 40 seconds. And it says we're reasoning. Um, and, and reasoning on the data, which is really interesting. And they sort of also talked about these agentic workflows, which we've written about a lot and researched a lot on the, uh, here at the Cube Research, and all about sort of learning human interaction. So when I think about the knowledge graph capability, you've got to be able to, and, and Jack, to your point about any data. Well, if you have any data, you've got to be able to harmonize that data so that revenue actually means revenue. It doesn't mean bookings. It doesn't mean NRR. It doesn't mean AI, it means revenue. And so you're not arguing in the meeting about what is this. This is a very simple example. Imagine with any data anywhere, how complex that could be on any system. Um, and then as well, this agent control framework that we've talked about, which seems like that's NVIDIA in, in this equation, but is this, Rob, in your mind, are we seeing the future of the application stack that the blowing away of the three-tier system, the database, the server, the, you know, with some middleware and the UI, UI is going to be a natural language interface. And this idea 
going beyond microservices, which are hard coded and fragile and brittle, and they break and they change, and you can't, you got to hard code them. Are we seeing the age of where computers and intelligent agents are going to observe what we do, all that sort of dark matter and dark data, and actually create new workflows and new applications on the fly? I mean, I think that's where it's going. I don't think we're anywhere close to that at this point, but I think that when you start to look down the path of where Vast is building in, they're definitely building up into that. And I think to your point, you get above the NIMS layer, that harmonization layer that we always talk about of you know what is revenue and how do you define it and maybe define in one set of data differently. Right now, what they've built is connecting all of the data together and it will know where revenue is uh, quoted all over the place. You still need to harmonize that and define and have kind of that definition on top of that still at this at this point in time. But you can easily see them moving up that stack and bringing stuff like DBT into there so that you're starting to do the data modeling at on top of, you know, the NVIDIA software and the Nemo stuff and the retrievers so that you have an, an enlightenment of those retrievers and embeddings. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's there yet. I think but you could see down that path because that's really needed to your point to get to these agents, building agents, building, you know, you know, the action models, the small action models, and then longer term, large action models, I would assume. Yes, uh, from, from that, uh, LLMs to SLMs to SAMs and LAMs, and uh, it's going to be a very interesting transition, but that's really where it starts to get interesting and where we might start seeing you know, much more tangible ROI. And so I want to end on economics. Um, you know, a lot of this business today, you've got hyperscalers buying from NVIDIA um, and, and you know, sending the stock market rocketing. Um, you've got companies that are you know, infrastructure companies like Dell and HPE you know, hopping on board and OEMing you know, GPUs. You know, but there's just not a lot of mainstream businesses. It was interesting, that's why we heard from HBSC uh, today, and some mainstream enterprises that are saying, yeah, we're actually using this platform, and presumably it's starting to throw off you know, some cash and be self-funding. But to your to point we were talking about earlier, Jack, I mean, AI is expensive. Yeah. And, and the ROI today has been you know, little singles, I'll call it. Um, how do you see this playing out and what role will VAST have in really driving AI to be self-funding um, so that we can you know, break out of this, frankly, the market you know, not growing, the macro not growing, the IT spending not growing through the roof. The AI piece is growing, but you got this sort of barbell effect. You got AI is hot, everything else is like, let's steal from everything else so we can fund the AI. When does it become self-funding? What, do, what are your thoughts on a economics of AI? Yeah, so I think we've got probably another two to three years before it becomes economical for most enterprises and, and even big enterprises. I mean, today, if you look at what AI, HBSC is a great example. They're a multi, I don't even know what the numbers are, huge billion dollar corporation, right? They can afford tens of billions of dollars to throw into something like AI to see if it's actually going to help them long term. Because look, they're a bank. If they prevent 1% less of fraud on their systems, it's, you're probably talking about tens of billions of dollars. Um, so putting a few million dollars into, into something like that is not a problem. If you're a general company, if you're a small, if you're a supermarket chain, if you're auto, auto dealership, you know, they're not small anymore either, but they're not going to put ten, tens of millions of dollars into AI. So it's got to get to a point where the ROI is reasonable for me. If I want to get a uh, 10% productivity improvement for my people, I can't spend 20% of my uh, of my revenues doing that. It's got to be something reasonable. And I think we're still two, two years, two to three years away from that for a couple of reasons. Number one is building models is very expensive. Very few companies can afford to build their own custom models. So that means that I've got to go to a, a hugging face or somewhere else and, and try to pull a model that will fit me. Then I have to fine tune it or rag it or you know, whatever I've got to do to it to make it uh, uh, for me and not for just the general purpose marketplace. And then I've got to find some place to run it. I'm not going to go out and spend, you know, billions, literally billions of dollars in, on 100,000 H100s. I can't afford to rent them either because it's costing, you know, $3 million an hour to rent. Uh, so it's got to move to a model where we're actually talking about smaller AI models. We're talking about a lot more data that we're bringing in from multiple places, which is where VAST comes in. 
And we're probably going to be talking about mostly inference at that point because most of the models are already going to be pre-built and then we'll just modify them slightly. This is going to take time to, to accomplish. Uh, VAST has a piece of that. The other players, not just uh, NVIDIA, but there are a lot of other chip players, they're going to have a, a place in this as well because there, there's a lot of concentration on custom AI uh, inference, inference type chips that will, will, will reduce the cost. And so uh, all of that's going to come together, but it's not going to be it's not going to be tomorrow. So Vast can play in the training game. Uh, it can sell to the GPU clouds. It can OEM its file system to HPEs of the world and get revenue there. And that's a bridge to when the market for inference actually overtakes the market for training. Not that training is going to go away. We don't right. believe that. But how do you see the economics? Let's close there. Yeah. No. I I think Jack is dead on with this. I think for it to come down market. As, you know, and get out of the HSBCs and uh, the, you know, Chan, uh, Zuckerberg type where they're building their own and they're, they're AI companies already because they're doing drug discovery and healthcare and fraud detection. And they've been doing AI for decades. XAI. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Grok and all yeah. that. It, you start to look at that, I, again, to come out of those really, hey, where I can spend 10% because I'm going to make back 30% off of that because it gets me some advantage. I, I think you need something. I, I, I got to say, I'm, I'm interested to see the TCO on what they're doing here because you should be able to compare it to going and, hey, I'm going to go to a Snowflake. I'm going to go to a Databricks. I'm going to go and roll my own uh, you know, data warehouse or go and use you know, one of the other ones, DBMSs that's out there or, or you know, to Jack's point, going to go out to another hyperscaler and, and just do it all there. I, this should be able to have a TCO. Now, you still have to buy, uh, you know, either the H100s or maybe you, get, you can get away with Ls above it because the compute layer, maybe it simplifies the compute layer by having all of the, you know, you already have NVIDIA in the box uh, for doing the VAST stuff and doing the NEMO and the NIMS and all of that. Um, I think that's yet to be seen if that will help bring it down stack, you know, bring the stack down market or not. But something has to happen there to like we know that the economics just isn't there right now. I mean, you have virtually unlimited capital, you know, right now funding this from the hyperscalers and others. But guys, great analysis. Thanks so much, Jack, for coming in. Rob being yep. here. Appreciate it. And thank you for watching theCUBE's special coverage of Vast Cosmos. You know, we're seeing the evolution of a new software layer that is pointing the way to the future of AI infrastructure. So often we see a startup that reaches escape velocity because they've created a solution as we were just talking about the economics. Can Vast be that 10X better at one tenth the cost and do things that were previously impossible or just not cost effective? Will Vast be that next great AI infrastructure company? You know, right now Vast is in a good position to be just that with a healthy balance sheet, strong growth, and cash flow positivity, which is exceedingly rare for a young company that's growing as fast as Vast. We're super excited to here to document and report on the ascendancy of Vast, as always, Silicon Angles. We got you covered with the news, the Cube Digital Video, and our team at the Cube Research. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.